In the last episode, we talked about how the wife of Bath differs from Christine de Pizan. The Octorias mean nothing to her. Experience is a much more important gauge to knowledge. And so let's, let's now look at the wife of Bath and how she debates with the Octorias. The wife of Bath, unlike Christine de Pizan, enters into the debate with the Octorias in order to show up their contradictions, right? In order to support her own interpretive agenda. And it's quite ingenious. Now remember, the prologue, as we've talked about it, which uh, gives sort of the guidelines to how to read a text, the who, what, where, and when, the prologues are traditionally associated with commentaries and philosophy and theology, right? They're associated with the interpretation of a text, always a text by an octora. So, so if I'm going to do a, a commentary on a text by an octora, my text would begin with a prologue describing my intentions. And that prologue, that academic prologue, which survives now in the introduction of any book you read, that prologue then moves to literature. And Chaucer uses this one in a very ingenious way because the wife of Bath is explaining to us how to interpret a text. What's interesting about the wife of Bath is that here her prologue is about interpreting her life in a debate, okay? And again, keep thinking of Lady Reason. With the Octoris and against those who use their discourses, the discourses of the Octoris, as authorities for their own. So in a way, experience is not enough. The wife of Bath claims experience is all that matters, but ultimately in her text, she proves otherwise. She must match wits text for text. I'm gonna show you one example. There are multiple examples of how she does this, and but let's look at one. Let's look at her defense for her many marriages using the Samaritan woman. Beside a well, Jesus, God and man, spake in reprieve of the Samaritan. Thou hast thee had five husbandes, quoth he, and that ilk man that now hath thee is not thine husband, thus said he certain. This is a translation of John chapter 4, verse 18. For you have had five husbands, and he who you have now is not your husband. Non est tu sphere. That means uh, not your man. It can also be husband. It's the same word. This he said truly very. Chaucer's translation is also an interpretation, and he gets this from St. Jerome's against Jovinian. It's a book that is listed among the contents of Jenkins' compilatio or compilation. He had a book that gladly nicht and day, for his disport he would read away. He clept it Valerie and Theophrasta, at which book he laughed away full fasta. And eke there was some time a clerk at Rome, a cardinal, that hich St. Jerome, that made a book against Jovinian. Now listen carefully. Because remember, this is about texts. This is Jerome's gloss of John 4.18 about the Samaritan woman. The gloss is an interpretation of this passage. He's talking about Jovinian's view that widows should be allowed to marry. For it is better to know a single husband. He used, he used the word, instead of using um, the Bible's veer, he uses um, maritus in all, in all of its declensions. For it is better to know a single husband, though he be a second or third, than to have many lovers. That is, it is more tolerable for a woman to prostitute herself to one man than to many. He's talking about um, marital sex, right? That if, if you need sex, then it's better for the woman to be married again. So it's a, it's a problem about sex. He continues, at all events, this is so 
if the Samaritan woman in John's gospel who said she had her sixth husband was reproved by the Lord because he was not her husband. And here, at this moment then, is Jerome's critique. For where there are more husbands than one, the proper idea of a husband, that is, a single person, is destroyed. What he's saying is that she chose a husband in order to have sex. And he is saying that there is only one husband. You cannot have a serial number of husbands. And then Jovinian says, he evokes Genesis, of course, at the beginning, now he's talking about Adam and Eve, one rib was turned into one wife. Jerome's reading of the Samaritan woman is that she has lovers and not a husband. And so she's become a prostitute. Now, the wife of Bath is not quite sure that is true. Is not thine husband, thus said he certain? What that he meant thereby, I cannot say. What's funny about the, um, the manuscript that we're looking at Ellesmere is that it includes Latin glosses identifying the sources even of her arguments as well as her adversaries. These are the glosses in the Ellesmere. You can see in my book version of it, there's more glosses. These are all written at the side in, a, in abbreviated Latin. These are interpretive glosses used to explicate the wife of Bath's interpretations. And it's funny, it's as if her interpretations in Middle English, mind you, are worthy of the same sort of glossing found in Latin commentaries on the Bible. And remember the glosses in Ellesmere manuscript are in an abbreviated Latin. So it's a Latin associated with the universities. In one way, then, it adds an academic color to the Wife of Bath's own commentaries. So what is her reading? She asked the text, in this case, the gospel, a question. Something you're supposed to do when you read any text, if you're a serious reader or an inventive one like the wife of Bath. But that I ask, why that that fifth man was none husband to the Samaritan? This leads to a big challenge. How many michte she had in mariage, yet heard I never tell an in miage upon this nombre definition. She's focusing on the ambiguity of that word vir in, um, in St. John's Gospel, right? And she's also being very literal. So what is the correct number? What she's saying is, is that Jerome's commentary and the text for that matter is not clear. And the commentary writers are acting as if he, Christ, is being clear. So the biblical passage is not clear. In other words, the wife of Bath now is a theologian, right? And she is putting exegesis, the interpretation of the scriptures, under scrutiny. Jesus says in John, after asking for some water, go call your husband. And she replies, non habeo virum, I don't have a husband or man. And then Christ says, benedicti, well said, you have no husband. You had five husbands, but whom you have now, non est tu sphere. He is not or your husband. So what is Jerome saying? Were they all married? Or as Jerome says, only one was truly her husband. The text is obscure, obviously, and it needs to be interpreted. That's exegesis 101. And so the wife of Bath challenges the theologians. Men may divine and gloss them up and down, but well I woot express without lie, God bade us for to wax and multiply, that gentle text can I well understand. That's an ingenious turn. She's arguing that the Bible is obscure. And I love how she mocks the glosses, 
the same glosses, mind you, that are on the side of her own text in the manuscript. If her words are also being glossed, remember, then she is a text, right? Because glossing is a textual activity. And what is implied is that glossing is a clerical activity that is self-interested. The wife of Bath looks for debate, and so she dives into the Old Testament, looking for contradictions. However, unlike the medieval exegetes, she does not try to harmonize the contradictions that unified the Bible. She exploits them. But of no numbre mensen made he, of bigamy or of octogamy, why should men then speck of it villainy? Lo, here the wise king, Don Solomon, I trow he had wives more than one. She brings into play King Solomon and his many wives as an exemplum. And this is what's quite funny. How is that going to work for Jesus' supposed limits to one husband or wife? according to St. Jerome's interpretation, being that St. Jerome is an authority. I mean, look, remember, the wife of Bath is a fighter, right? She's a Martian. She's a fighter. She's like our hey, seat. what are you doing in my office? I'm trying. What are you, There's no this? room. We have no room in, in this place. I'm get sorry. out of my office. I will get out of your office. What? Please, can I just have one minute? Just let me finish. No. She's like a Martian. She's like our seat. She's a fighter. And how does she respond with her husband? She rips her husband's book out. And you would probably rip my books up too, wouldn't you? Get out of my home office. All right, just give me one more minute. During the plague, the master bedroom has now become her office. So what is the upshot in regards to the wife of Bath? Besides the potential pleasures of sex, if you submit to her law, the wife also offers you the potential pleasures of reading. To think about other possibilities if you submit to her law. As an authority in her own right, grounded in experience and authorized by the many glosses and the margins of her own text, she makes possible your own interpretations. By insisting that the Bible's open to multiple meanings, not one authoritative one, because its writers were grounded in this exegetical interpretive system, medieval writers are conscious of the role of interpretation in the text that they are making. That means the role of the reader is understood in the writing of a medieval text. Marie de France, is the most famous example. And she wrote in her prologue to the Lays that because writers are purposely obscure, and she's exploiting an interpretation of, of a Prisian, who was a great grammarian, Prisian said that words become obscure through time. In other words, Middle English is obscure to you because you do not understand the words. But with the study of grammar, Middle English becomes clearer to you. Well, Marie de France altered that. And she said that writers purposely are obscure. Not the product of time, but the product of a writer's intentions. And the reader, she said, is the one who supplies a kind of surplus meaning. In other words, the text is incomplete without the readers adding something. Now the surplus in Marie de France is sexual as well. Finally, the wife of Bath's philosophy of interpretation is similar to the Miller's Tale. It's grounded in pleasure. In the next episode, we will look at scholastic questions inside the Friar and Sumner's Tales. All right, guys, don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that notification bell. Why do I always have to be mean? Why can't I be cute sometimes? Because, like, you have roles. Like in, I am. I'm adorable. But yeah, but, like, in the Noah plays, you're a great Mrs. Noah. In Wife of Bath, you're a great Wife of Bath.